is. Oh, what a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. There's no name higher than your name, oh Lord. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring. The praise of so thankful that I can call on that name. Better than that, he has given us his name. What an honor and a privilege today to serve such a God that he claims us. He claims us as his own. I'm so thankful to be here tonight, and I'm so excited and expectant for what the Lord is going to do. We've had a wonderful week worshiping with your church family. 
We've had such a great week with your pastors, and they have blessed us, and we have laughed, and we've been brutally honest, and we've had lots of good food. (laughs) And I just want to say to you, thank you so much for the opportunity. I don't take it lightly. I don't take it lightly sharing the message of Jesus Christ. It's my life, and it's what I, I, I found as a little child was the, the greatest joy and the greatest excitement I ever experienced was being able to tell others the good news that transformed my life and is transforming lives all over this world at just the mention of that holy name. What a mighty God we serve. I want to get right into the word tonight. And if you have your Bibles, would like to follow along in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. If you'd like to go there with me, we will begin reading the word. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Beginning at verse 1. When you're there, say amen. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria, and behold, they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Engedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. I want you to hear those two statements, those two clauses, because they're very important. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah, and Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? Rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God? who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people Israel and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever. And they dwelt therein, and they have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil come upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou given us to inherit. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Heavenly Father, I pray over the next few minutes that you would open my mouth to deliver what you have placed in my heart and that the words spoken would fall on ready soil, ready ground, and bring forth the fruit that you have ordained. I pray that you would be honored and glorified, lifted above any other name in this place today. We give you honor, sweet Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Many of us today are very familiar with this passage of Scripture, and it's one that I have heard taken a lot of ways. You may or may not have heard it the way I'm about to take it. I'm amazed sometimes at how we can get in the Word and begin to study, and every time we open the Scripture, the Lord will reveal something unique and significant if our hearts are prepared. In this passage of Scripture, we see a dilemma for the nation of Judah. Jehoshaphat at this time has been king for approximately 18 years. 
He has been on the throne for approximately 18 years. He is not a novice king. He is not new to his position. He has done pretty well and, in fact, has prospered in a lot of ways. But there's some dilemmas that come our way that all of our success and all of our prosperity can't do anything about. Have you ever come to a season in your life that all of your skill and all of your knowledge and all of your training and all of your education and all of your experience could not prepare you to face? This was a king that was a right king at a right moment that had been ruling and ruling successfully when all of a sudden the word comes that the nation of Moab, Ammon, and other nations that surround them are coming together in this this state of uh, union to oppose the nation of Judah and hopefully drive them out of the land of promise that they have inhabited. There is absolutely no question that the multitude outnumbers Judah. They are far outnumbered, they are outmanned, they are outstrength, they are outtooled, they are outskilled in every single way. And though Jehoshaphat has been successful, there's this moment where he recognizes he's never had to face anything like this before. He's never come eye to eye with a situation of this magnitude. He don't have the answers and the solutions, and yet he is expected, he is responsible as the leader of the nation to guide his people in this difficult time. Aren't you glad that he was a king that did not take lightly his calling? He did not take lightly his calling. He did not take lightly his responsibility. The Bible tells us that Jehoshaphat feared. It's undeniable that he is outnumbered and he is willing to admit that he is terrified at what he is facing. There's some of us in this room that need to come to that place that we'll admit sometimes in our situations we can't do anything about it. And we like to sometimes hold it all together and put on the face as Christians that we don't have those moments of anxiety and those moments of fear. But the reality is we are warring a war with an enemy that holds nothing back and there's moments in this life that as long as we are flesh and blood we're going to have fear we're going to have anxiety we're going to have questions we're going to have uncertainty we're not going to have all the answers and all the solutions and we're not meant to we were never intended to do what God alone is intended to do Jehoshaphat is afraid And I want to say to you tonight that fear is not the same thing as a lack of faith. I have so many times heard people try to say that fear is this absence of faith, and that is not the the case at all. The greatest expressions of faith are when you do what you know the Lord has told you to do in spite of the fear that you're facing. It's not a lack of humanity. Our humanity is going to rise every now and then. We're going to feel things. We were created emotional. And there's going to be moments that we feel emotions and, and thoughts and ideas that we really don't want anything to do with. But our faith will go against our feelings and do what the Lord says to do when our emotions say, what good could that do? What benefit could there be? So he is a man that is bad. Battling fear. But as he is battling fear, there's this pivotal decision to give in to that spirit of fear or to exercise the faith in the word of God and go to that place where he bows himself, he postures himself in the presence of the Lord and waits to hear what God would say. The Bible says he set himself to seek the Lord. He sets himself to seek the Lord. This is pride bowed down on the ground in front of his entire nation. Brother Omar, good to see you. This is pride bowed down on the ground saying before a nation of people he's supposed to lead, I don't have any answers. I don't have any solutions. 
I don't really know what to do about the mess that we are in. The only thing I know to do is to go back to the place that my fathers and my grandfathers and my great-grandfathers went and to posture myself in the temple until I hear something from the Lord. So he calls this assembly of the people, and the Bible says they come together from all of the cities of Judah, and they set themselves to seek the face of the Lord. They're in this corporate assembly of prayer. In difficult times, they don't know what to do, but they know where to go. And they're willing. Hear that word. They're willing. It's not just a head knowledge that says, I'm supposed to pray right now. They're willing to forsake everything else going on their lives to set themselves to seek the Lord. I want you to read through the lines of the scripture when it says they stood before the Lord with their little ones. That means they brought their babies too. There was nobody excluded from this assembly. They gathered to, some of them were crying, some of them were hungry, some of them were dissatisfied, but this was a moment of prayer. This was a season that somebody had to touch God and nothing was going to be the reason that they didn't press through. They needed God over their children. They needed God over their families. And it was absolutely necessary that if they were going to survive the storm that was just on the other side of the mountain, that they touched heaven and they touched him together. Oh, that God's people. <laughs> oh, that God's people would have an understanding of what can happen when we come together in one mind and one accord. And we refuse to let the circumstances and the fears and the situations keep us from that place of fervent intercession. Jehoshaphat calls a solemn assembly and they begin to pray. I, I, I know if you study the word, this Jehoshaphat's a pretty good king. He's a pretty godly king. But up to this moment, there's been very few significant accounts of his personal relationship with God. He has been on the scene quite a few times, but there's very few accounts of his personal relationship with God. But there's a knowledge. There's a knowledge deep down on the inside of him. And he begins to pray a prayer that sounds like this. Oh, Lord God of our fathers. Now I want to ask you a question. Why did he start like that? Why did he start by saying, God of our fathers and not my God? Sister Christy, I kind of believe he wasn't exactly sure that he was standing in the same place of relationship with God that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had stood. I don't think he even felt like he stood in the same place of relationship that David, his great-great-great-grandfather, had stood. So it's almost like he's calling on grace that those before him had walked in. He's remembering the God of his ancestors, the God of those that had come before. And he's like, Lord, I know you were their God. I know you showed up for them. I've heard the accounts of all the times that they came before you and you parted waters that they couldn't cross over and you provided in desert places and you conquered armies and enemies that were greater. I've heard all the stories and I know you were their God, but there's not this expression of confidence in where he stands personally in this pivotal moment where he's accountable for a nation. Why does that matter? Because there's a whole lot of people in this room right now that have lived their spiritual walk hearing about somebody that stood in a position that they had a direct line with the throne room and you said that can't be me. Because there's a whole lot of people in this room that could point to somebody in your history that you know knew God. You could call them in a moment of desperation and you knew that when they prayed, heaven stood in attention. The little young lady that sat over here next to us, my youngest daughter, when I was pregnant with her, I was given a diagnosis that was terminal for her. Her brain didn't develop right. 
a whole chamber did not develop at all. And the doctors basically told me it was a hopeless situation. My own life was in jeopardy carrying her. I was given the option to terminate the pregnancy because she couldn't survive anyway. And if she survived for a few moments, she would have no quality of life. Did I accept the report? No, because I had a praying mama that I knew had a direct line. So I called my mom, and I began to tell her of the reports that I had received. And we got before the Lord. She got on her face in a prayer room until she touched God. And while I was laying in a bed with blood pressure through the roof, trying not to have a stroke, infection in every part of my body, and the, uh, the message that my daughter was not going to survive, my mom comes storming the bedroom, lays hands on me, begins to pray in the Holy Ghost, and a word comes comes out an interpretation that I was healed, that she was healed. And that little girl has shocked every doctor because they can't find anything wrong with her. And she's so advanced that she blows their mind. Said so that we know those people that have that direct connection, but so often we don't believe it's us. It's as if we think that they were some sort of super spiritual people that God showed special favor and grace on. And people like us that struggle with fear and doubt and insecurities and other sin struggles that we thought we got victory over and then we fell back in it and we had to ask God for mercy. Surely he wouldn't use somebody like us like that. Oh God of our fathers. It says, if he starts off with this uncertainty, that God is going to work for him. Do you know what I love about calling on the name of God? Is when you start that sincere, fully surrendered, submitted posture of prayer. The kind of submission where you will throw yourself down on an altar and say, God, I don't care who sees me. I don't care what they think about me. I don't care if they talk about me. I've got to touch you. That posture of prayer, God meets us there. And as we pray in that posture of humility, there's a confidence that begins to rise in who we are in God. It's amazing that humility produces a confidence with God. It's not pride, but humility and submission will help us meet with God. God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. So he lowers himself and he starts off this prayer reminding God of who God was for his fathers reminding God of who he is I just kind of feel like he was trying to talk God into it oh God are you not God in heaven do you not rule over all the kingdoms and all the nations have you ever prayed like this God are you not the healer God are you not the provider God, are you not the one that, God, couldn't you change this circumstance? God doesn't need to know who he is. He knows who he is. But sometimes we got to remember who God is. He's not sure about who he is. He's not sure about his relationship with God. So it's like he begins to profess, you were my father's God. You are the God that operated in generations past. You are God in heaven. You do rule over the nations. Your hand does have power and all might. Nobody's able to stand against you. And as he's praying this prayer, he begins to ask this question, are you our God? Lord, are you our God? Will you be our God again? Will you show up for us? It's like we see this faith building as he begins to confess the nature of God. And he becomes more bold and confident. Lord, are you not the God that drove out the inhabitants of the land before the people Israel? Are you not the God that gave it to Abraham, your friend? Uh, did those that dwelt therein built you a sanctuary. Did you not say, God... When they built the temple, that if pestilence came, if famine came, if troubles came, if war came, and we came to this place, and we called on your name, because your name 
Jesus in this house, that you would hear us, oh God, and you would answer us in our time of trouble. What is he doing? He is stirring up his faith. He's reminding himself of the promises of God. He is declaring the word as he begins to plead before the throne. I believe that somewhere in his history, there had been somebody that told him, your great, great, great grandpa, David, got a promise from God that if evil befalls, the grace of the Lord will never be taken away from the descendants of David. If they will just turn and call, the grace of God will never be taken away from the descendants of David. I believe he heard the accounts of his great, great grandpa Solomon as he constructed the house. It's where we read the verse that says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. He was reminding himself of the promises of God. Did you not say, God, I'm calling on you. He said, I have no power against this great multitude that is coming up against us. We don't know what to do. But our eyes, our eyes, oh Lord, are on you. (laughs) Somebody got to get their eyes off of themselves and their own abilities or their own lack of ability. Hear me. You got to quit looking at what you don't have and what you don't possess and who you think you're not and get your eyes fixed on the God that is greater. He has never expected you to do divine things without supernatural power. He knows where clay pots. The glory's not in the vessel. The glory's in what fills the vessel. He's in a posture of submission fervent intercession, hoping, praying, believing that God will respond in a supernatural way to him. This is not a passive prayer moment. He is standing before an entire nation that's about to know whether God will answer him. This is not a passive prayer moment. It's all on the line right now. And he willingly lays himself on an altar and says, I will admit my lack and my desperate need. If we really want to see God do the things that we profess, we long to see God do. We must expect that we have to follow the same models that we see in Scripture in the lives of people that God responded to. Not these passive prayers that cost us nothing or these feeble expressions of faith that we're not accountable for. But this bold, confident prayer, not in who we are, but in who God is and His faithfulness to keep His word time and time again. Jehoshaphat looked like he was on trial. But in this posture, it was actually God's faithfulness that was on trial. And God was not going to fail to keep his word. Oh, if we could come to that same conclusion. They're in this posture of prayer, and I'm just now getting to where I want to get. All of that was just extra. Because as they're standing there in this company with Their elders, their spouses, and their babies. Generation upon generation gathered into a corporate assembly, professing their desperate need of God. Verse 14 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. 
do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. They're seeking the Lord in this place of pure desperation. And as they do, God causes the Spirit to come suddenly, suddenly upon a fifth generation Levitical priest. A fifth generation Levitical priest descending from a line of prophetic worshipers that God would move upon by his spirit and cause them to open their mouths and declare. Why does that matter? Why does he say Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph? Why is it there? Why did he record it? Why didn't he just say a young man prophesied? Because there was something deeper in it. There was something deeper. This was the great, great, great grandson of Asaph. Do you know who Asaph was? He was a psalmist that was contemporary with King David. In fact, when we read the book of Psalms, many of the, the, the words, the worship songs that we read in the book were penned by Asaph. Asaph wrote a great majority of those that were not written by David. They were the two greatest psalmists likely in their time. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of the Lord fell upon this fifth generation Levitical priest. This fifth generation. Did you know the Bible doesn't say it had ever fell on him before? It doesn't say he had ever prophesied before. It does, doesn't even say that he was a worshiper like all of those generations that had gone on before him. I don't know if he had any clue at all what was on the inside of him. I don't know if he knew the magnitude of the heritage that he carried within the mantle that was falling to him. It's not till a moment when a people come together in a corporate intercession that something wakes up in a young man that causes them to hear the voice of the Lord. He's a son of Asaph. He's a, he's a generation that would come after. The Bible said the spirit of the Lord fell and the terminology there literally means it fell suddenly the spirit of courage from the Lord it's as if he said in timidity in the shadows and all of a sudden in corporate worship something comes upon him that's never come upon him before and he goes out of character and out of nature to prophesy to a king what the Lord has to say to him He's likely never been a prophet before this time. Almost every scholar agrees. There's this suddenly moment where the spirit of the living God fills his life and awakens something that has been dormant all along. Asaph is a skilled worshiper, dedicated to walking in relationship with God. Grandparents in this room, great-grandparents in this room, hear me out for just a moment because I need to talk to you. Asaph is a skilled worshiper. He has dedicated his life to his relationship with God. He has made solemn vows and solemn covenants, and he is walking them out. He's a famous singer. He's a gifted musician. He's a highly regarded writer. He's one of the greatest of his times. In the days of King Hezekiah, the Bible says the people are commanded by the king to sing the songs of David and Asaph. His words are so prophetic, they are regarded as scripture in their day. And they are ordered to sing the songs of David and Asaph because they recognize they are a divine word from the Lord. The Bible tells us they sing those songs and they offer joyous praise and they bow down in corporate worship. So he is causing the people to come into this state of worship in his day, in his prime. The Bible tells us that Asaph, Jedithan, and Heman, they reported directly to the king. 
So he has a direct line to the authorities in the land, in the nation, influence. They and their families were all to be trained in making music before the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 25 and 7 that each one of them was an accomplished musician. A generational gifting, a generational mantle that in the days of Asaph is passed to his sons. It's passed to his sons. He's instilling the word, the love of worship, the surrender to God in his children. Asaph is a mentor, a mentor to those that are not even his biologically. He invests his whole life into others, leaving a legacy for others that follow. He passes knowledge and skill to his children, his grandchildren. He mentors those in the nations. We find the legacy of Asaph's descendants are described both in the books of Chronicles and in the book of Nehemiah. It was Asaph that wrote in Psalms 50, Offer unto God thanksgiving. Pay your vows unto the Most High. Call upon Him in the day of trouble. He will deliver you and you will glorify Him. He wrote in Psalm 73, 26, My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my life and He is my portion forever. In Psalm 77, verse 1, Asaph wrote, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. Verse 14, he says, Thou art the God that does wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among your people. Thou hast with thy arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. He's writing these declarations these psalms because he wants there to be a legacy handed down that says when I was in trouble I called on the name of the Lord and he heard me and he answered me from his holy habitation but maybe my favorite psalm of Asaph since my youth is Psalm 78 and it says, give ear, O my people, to my laws. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we heard and we know, and our fathers have told them to us. Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done for he established a testimony of Jacob and he appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born they, they, who should rise up declare them to their children that they would set their hope in God Asaph committed his life to carrying a mantle and leaving a legacy with another generation. Did he go through discouraging times? You better believe it. The days of David were marked with war throughout. There were more struggles and hardships and difficulties that King David faced than almost anybody we read about. But Asaph did not let the circumstances of the present generation keep him from, heart, from, from nurturing the gifts and the callings of God in the next generation. And in the next generation, he stewarded the anointing and he maintained a posture of prayer. And five generations later, in a prayer meeting, God awakens the call of God on his great, great, great grandson. Does it matter? Yes, it does. Does it matter your commitment to fasting and to praying, to bowing your knee, to keeping your faith, to declaring the promises when everything is going wrong? Yes, it matters. You don't know how far the reach is going to be of your faith. You don't know how far the reach is. Brother Mitch spoke yesterday. Man, I've got to hurry. He spoke yesterday about the grandma 
that was spirit-filled in her 40s and prayed him through to deliverance when he came to her house messed up, as messed up as he could be in a moment, not even sure the thoughts in his mind were reality. He was in such a state. And how his grandmother would lay hands on him and pray in the Holy Ghost. And it was in that prayer, that intercession, that all of the chaos and confusion began to leave his life. I've heard him testify that when she would remove her hand, he'd go right back into the battle. So she'd have to pace it again and pray again until there was a breakthrough. His mama didn't get saved and delivered first. Her grandson did, and her grandson let him his mama to Jesus because a grandma understood that there may be bad situations but if you will put yourself in a posture of prayer the Lord will remember you the Lord will remember you five generations later an anointing is woken in a, in a prophetic worshiper that doesn't know he's a prophet and probably doesn't feel like much of a worshiper until he bows himself before the throne room and the Holy Ghost begins to fall on his life. But the word that comes brings hope to the next generation. This is a powerful picture. Because I see Jehoshaphat that is the fifth generation from David. And I see Jehaziel that is the fifth generation from Asaph. And they know he's a God of their fathers. Both of them know. But they've never experienced God like their fathers did until now. It's a suddenly moment. There's some of you in this room, you have prayed and you have prayed and you have sought and you have sought and you didn't see things happen. So the enemy plants that lie that either it's not real or it's not real for you. That you're not in that same position with God. There's not a record of any moment till this moment that God does what he does. And he doesn't take him through a leadership program before he causes him to prophesy and the whole nation to hear. There's a suddenly moment. Can somebody hear me for just a moment? You don't know when your suddenly's coming. You don't know when your suddenly's coming. But I can tell you that if we forsake the posture of the intercession of seeking, we'll never see the moment. We might be moments from a breakthrough, but if we forsake the posture of intercession, we'll never see the moment. He has no idea what's inside of him. There's somebody in this room, you have no idea what's inside of you. God's going to take you completely out of character when you place yourself in that position to wait for the Lord and awaken something in you that's going to cause other people to say, did he just do that? Did she just do that? Well, I know his family history, but I've never seen the signs or the marks. Sometimes that mark comes suddenly. It reveals itself suddenly, but it doesn't come until the people begin to pray until the Spirit comes. Until they pray until the Spirit comes. Not a casual experience. Not a casual Sunday morning. Not a good worship set. This is desperation. We must touch heaven. And there's no other option. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. And he says in verse 15, listen. All you Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight. 
You will not need to fight. How many times are we fighting battles we just need to pray through? We just need to pray through. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Get in that posture that you're called to really hold and hold your ground. Don't stop. Pastor Mitch, you said it last night. It's not a passive patience. It's an enduring patience. The kind of patience that doesn't relent until the victory comes. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Verse 18, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. This word comes from an unlikely candidate. From a young man that has no idea what God really wants to do in his life. But he's in the middle of a corporate assembly that is touching God. I can't get past this tonight. There's somebody in this room has got to hear the word of the Lord. You may not have seen yet what God wants to do through your life. But maybe it's because you haven't postured yourself long enough. You haven't patiently endured long enough. You haven't kept the faith in spite of those inner doubts and those inner worries long enough to see the suddenly that he wants to produce in your life. But suddenly come suddenly. So don't relent. Hold your position. Until the moment comes, that breakthrough comes, hold your position. Do not become discouraged, and don't doubt the mercy of your Lord to show up on your behalf. Hold your position. Now, the next passage, I'm not going to read it all right now. It's one of our Pentecostal favorites. Is anybody in this room an expressive worshiper? Like, you're really expressive. Like, you make a scene every time, and you don't really want to make a scene. It just happens. Brother Travis, I, I've told so many people, I, I wish I could go to camp meeting and not, like, blow up my whole aisle. I wish I could go to these conferences, events, and just be still and dignified and calm and composed. It's not in me. It's not in me. I'm loud. I'm excited. I'm expressive. My arms are everywhere. I'm going to yell out. I mean, it's going to happen. Right? So I love the passage about the praisers. Because this word comes to them, and they realize that the battle's already won. And so then the praisers go out, and they lead the battle, right? They don't take swords, they take their worship. They don't take swords, they take their praises. They go out worshiping and glorifying God. And as the praiser in me, I love that. But you hear me for just a minute. They didn't have the faith to praise like that until they prayed like that. And there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that think if I sing it loud enough or I shout it loud enough or if I declare it loud enough, I'm going to believe God for it. No, you're not because it's not about what you do. It's about posturing yourself till there's none of you and believing God. And when his presence comes, then so does the faith to believe God for mighty things. Oh, yes, I'm going to worship expressively. I'm going to dance and I'm going to shout and have a good time. But it's not because. My praise alone changes things. It's what's happening in my prayer closet that gives me the confidence that God's going to show up for me and I can dance and see the victory because I've interceded to the breakthrough that is inevitable. 
I love to talk about the praisers, but we have to understand it's not the praise that brings the response of God until there is an intercessory prayer before the throne room. They pray through before they praise through. They pray through before they praise through. I'm going to tell you I love to worship, but if the only time you're expecting God to move on your behalf is when you show up at church and the worship's just right and you think you're going to praise and every giant's going to fall, I'm here to tell you that what happens in your prayer closet releases the word that releases faith that wins the battle. It's in the place of waiting on the spirit. It's seeking the Lord until the spirit comes. They win a battle with faith that is confident. They dance, they sing, they have themselves a good old time because they know the Lord has spoken to them and God's not a man that he should lie. So they know the battle is won because they have touched God. They do win that battle. Musicians, if you want to come. Verse 25 tells us, When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil. They're spoiled. What is the spoil? They have just driven the enemy away by a mighty hand of God, never lifting a sword. They have prayed through, and then they pray through. And God fights their battles, and the Bible tells us the enemy is so confused, they just begin to scatter and run for their lives. And as they do, the enemy leaves precious possessions behind, not even having time to collect what is precious to them. And the people of Israel that a moment ago had a threat from the enemy that the enemy was going to take everything that was precious to them. Hmm. In this place of intercession, now they are collecting everything that was precious to their enemy. They have not been stripped. They have been equipped. They have not lost ground. They have gained treasure. They have not gone backwards. They have become inhabitants, inheritance of new possessions. The Bible says that there was an abundance of valuables, precious jewelry, more than they had the ability to carry away. And it took them three days to gather the spoils. <laughs> three days to collect all of the spoils that the enemy had left behind. And the Bible said they called it the Valley of Barakic, which means the Valley of Blessing. And it's called that unto this day. Does that sound familiar? It's called that to this day. What does that mean? You see, they did not understand the magnitude of that posture of prayer. They didn't understand the magnitude of coming together as a corporate body and interceding till they touched heaven. Because it did not just cause their enemy to be unsuccessful. It caused their sons and daughters to give birth to callings and anointings that the enemy thought he had eradicated out of their life. And it caused them to inherit treasures that they never would have had ownership of had they not come face to face with the battle. Oh, the devil doesn't want you to know that your battle can give birth to blessing beyond measure. The enemy doesn't want you to know that what's against you has the power to release something inside of you that he spent his whole life trying to keep silent so you would never come to the awareness that there is anointing and a purpose and a plan for your life that is greater than the identity you've been walking in. He doesn't want you to know that the battle is a pivotal moment. The moment where you just keep fighting in the flesh and you struggle and you struggle or you get yourself in a posture of intercession and you seek till the Spirit comes. 
You will not find a place in the scripture, not one, where a man or woman of God in faith began to diligently seek the Lord that they not only triumphed, but they gained ground. They gained more. And they would not relent. They would not listen to fears and doubts and insecurities and uncertainties. When grandmas and grandpas and sons and daughters and children came together in faith and said, we may never have seen it like this. We may never have personally experienced it like they did, but we believe the word of the Lord is true. So why don't we trust him enough to throw ourselves on an altar and say, it has to be you, God. It has to be you. The valley of blessing. The place of their greatest battle became the valley of blessing. What's been against you, what's been against you, doesn't have the power to hold hostage what's inside of you. It doesn't have the power to hold hostage the gift and the calling of God that is within you. The enemy knows what's there. The enemy knows what's there. But will you trust God enough to allow God to do His work? Get ourselves out of the way. Get ourselves out of the way. I'm never going to be enough, God. I was never expected to be. I was just meant to position myself to receive the glory and the grace of your spirit that fights my battles for me. Would you stand with me around this room? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word tonight. I thank you because I know in my heart today that there are sons and daughters in this room right now. And Lord, there's some that's not even here tonight that have gifts and callings on their life that have been there. They've been passed generation upon generation. There's some that go back many generations that just like Mitch, Lord, may look like there was a generation that missed it, that lost it. But you remember the seeds that were planted and you remember the faithfulness of your servants. Their sons and daughters that have not yet tapped into what generations before tapped into. And Lord, we haven't seen the same power or the same wonders or the same works. But that does not mean you are not the same God. And our faith cries out to you today, Lord. God, to crush any pride within our heart that keeps us from that posture of submission. Because we want to see you. And we want to know you in your glory, in your majesty, in your awe and wonder. Father, for grandparents and parents in this room that have tried to walk the walk of faith and have sons and daughters that seem to have gone astray, give them the courage and the confidence to hold their position, not to listen to the lies of fear and doubt, to trust in your sovereign hand, your divine hand that can reach down in the lowest and darkest of places at the most interesting of moments, Lord caused them to come into that suddenly let us not be discouraged or dismayed by circumstances that are bigger than us but trust Lord prepare our hearts to receive your grace that is bigger than any mountain any battle and any struggle that we may face give us a hunger that won't relent a longing that cannot be satisfied until your spirit comes sovereignly 
upon each one of us, O Lord. Awaken, awaken, awaken the longing for you. Awaken the mighty men and women of faith. And awaken the sons and the daughters. We're going to have a time of prayer. There's some of you in this room right now that you know. You know that the word of the Lord that's gone over your life, that whisper you heard in the middle of the night, that, that sense or that urging that you felt when you opened the word tells you there's more than what you've tapped into and there's more than what you've experienced. There's more than what you've tasted of. There's more than what you've seen. But you've heard the voice of the accuser that wants you to question whether or not God will move like that for you. Whether he will do in you what he has done in those that have gone before. I want to ask you to do something courageous right now. And if that's you, I want you to step out of the lie. Step out of the lie of doubt. Step out of the lie of fear. Step out of the, the words of the enemy. And I want you to come forward and say, God, I'm not settling. I'm not settling for less than what I know you have spoken over me and what has been invested in me and what you're calling me to. Just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not coming and I won't stand outside the promises and the blessings of God. I won't stand outside of it. There's some of you in this room that you have literally watched the enemy wreck your descendants, your children, your grandchildren. You have done your best to instill the word of God and you have watched the enemy wreak havoc in their lives. Hold your position. Don't get discouraged by what you see. Our eyes are on you, Lord. We're not looking at the condition. We're not looking at the situation. Our eyes are on you. Do I have some faith-filled, spirit-filled believers that right now will storm heaven for sons and daughters and say, I will not relent in pursuing in faith their salvation, their deliverance, their healing, their restoration. I will plead at the throne room until the breakthrough comes. Is there anybody in this room right now for your son, for your daughter, for your grandchild wants to come forward and say, Father, raise it up. Raise up that steadfast faith that will not be swayed out of position will not be swayed out of position. I won't relent. I don't see it. I don't like the condition, but I will not relent their soul. I will not relent in the pursuit of their... I will not give up what God gave me to my enemy when God has said I can come to this place and seek his face and he will hear from heaven and he will forgive their sin. I will not relent in my pursuit until I see what the Lord has said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prayer team, come. If there's some saints in this room want to gather around you, are welcome. We are going to pray, and we are going to touch God. We are here to touch heaven today. Let's go in. Let's go in. Throw it on the altar. Throw yourself on the altar. Let's go in. Throw your heart and faith before the Lord. Hallelujah.